When it comes to humility, are you a pursuer or a procrastinator? When it comes to humility, are you a pursuer of humility or are you a procrastinator? Put yourself with me, if you would, in a classroom. Are you the type of person that thinks about humility? You wonder and, and ponder how to have more of it in your life. You like to learn about humility so you can put it into practice. Or are you a procrastinator? Are you waiting till the last minute and hoping that just suddenly, out of nowhere, like spontaneous combustion, humility will just come out of you? Anyone have that happen in their life before? Or do we have other things that come out of us? The Bible talks about the virtue of humility very clearly. It calls us to humble ourselves. It won't just come out of it. It's something that we have to pursue. Well, let's be honest and ask again, what usually does come out of us? And to be fair, I'll put myself out there. So this last week, I had the opportunity to go to Orlando. I've been sharing with you guys the last several years, four or five years, I've been working on a master's from Wheaton College. And this was my last class, Change Leadership. It was easily, hands down, the most amazing class I took in the program. More about that in the weeks to come. So I show up in class, four other pastors and the professor. There's six of us in the room. And I don't know about how you are when you get around people that are in the same industry as you, but like I said, I'm willing to put myself out there for a second. Something happens to me when I get around these other guys that I actually know. They're about, they've been pastoring some, and they all have churches about the same size. I am the oldest guy in the room. And so when I walk in there, there's like this, I, I, I need you, this really happens to me. Like there's like this swag in my step, you know, that like, <laughs> that comes out. And I, I like these guys to know, you know, like, yeah, I've been pastoring 22 years. Yeah. You could learn from me. I want to be considered. I want to be looked at. And when one of the other pastors, Jordan, when the professor says, hey, Jordan, that's a really good point, or that was a great observation, I think to myself, what about my point? What about my observation? I mean, wasn't it just as good, just as valuable, just as significant? If we made a list of things that were important to God, virtues that he wanted us to pursue, virtues that he said, this is on the top of the list that you must display. Where do you think humility would fall? It's interesting, this book, or this class, it was on changed leadership. We read seven books for the class. Three were written to uh, business leaders and four were written to Christian leaders about leadership. Seven books. Every single one of them, without a shadow of a doubt, made it absolutely clear. If you want a healthy culture and a healthy organization, the number one thing that will bring that about is humility in the leaders. And that didn't even count the Jim Collins book, Good Great, which is the quintessential book on business leadership. And in his research, he did this extensive research on all kinds of organizations. He developed this metrics for what it means to be a leader in organizations. And he said in order to be a level five leader, the number one thing that characterized all of those leaders was humility. Should we be surprised that the greatest leader of all time, displayed humility in every area of his life. And on the night before he died, he humbly served his students and his followers and his betrayer and then asked them to follow his lead. So let me ask you again, when it comes to humility, are you a pursuer or a procrastinator? We're in a series called Thrive, and 
If you want to discover joy, freedom, the power of the new life that Christ invites you into, we must be pursuers of humility. Paul teased out this reality in his letter to the Philippians in a very famous hymn and passage. And we're going to spend some time just digging into it this morning. We'll look at three points that Paul makes in this passage. And we're going to look at the environment for humility, the effort towards humility, and the effect of humility. The environment, the effort, and the effect. So let's start. Let me read our passage here. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul wrote this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, compare my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to describe the mind of Christ. Well, let's begin with the environment for humility. Unless you're a monk or you live in a cave, God says it you're going to become humble, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you around other people. It is the incubator for humility. Relationships is where we develop this concept and idea of what it means to be humble and express humility and pursuit of humility. So Paul talks to this church here in Philippi, and what he does actually is here at the very beginning of this passage, he sets up this spectrum for us, and I, and I want to point it out to us. First, he talks about what we have. What we have, the gospel, listen to it again, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. And so maybe you heard it there, but he, he lists out four things that we have in Christ. And when he says, if there is any, it's this application or this implication. He's really saying, since there is this, right? You can hear that what he's saying. He's saying, if there is this, he's implying, since you have this, and he'll keep going, but this is what you have. And he he lists out these four, four things. He says, since there is encouragement in Christ, since there is comfort from how God loves you, Since there is power from the Spirit, since there is care from God's family. I'm wondering if you heard the beauty of the gospel in there. Paul basically is starting out this concept, this call to humility, by describing that there are four things that you have. You have Christ's comfort, God's love, the power of the Spirit, and the family of God around you. He's saying since those four realities are true, since you have these four things, you are called to this. He says we are called to be unified. Verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He, He describes three things here. He says, have the same mind. He's calling us to be a people that are unified around the mission of God and his kingdom purposes. He says, have the same love, that this love that you tasted, have it with each other. And then I love the message, the Eugene Peterson, his translation, it's really a paraphrase, but the word he uses there for this third thing is he says, be deep-spirited friends. That's what he describes when it says being in full accord and of one mind. So if you will, there's this spectrum that he's drawing out for us, that that he's, he's leading us into. He's saying, look, here's what you have. On the one side, you have the gospel. And then on the other side, he says, you're called to be unified. Be unified, be loving, be friends. And, And so in this moment, we should pause for a second and we should go, how are we doing? How are we doing at being unified? How are we doing at sacrificing for each other, being deep-spirited friends? And if we're being honest, we would say, well, Brian, with who? With who do you mean those things? 
with people that are like me socially, people that are like me so, uh, politically, people that are like me culturally, people that are, that are like me financially, great. I'm good at those things. I like people that are just like me. I can handle that. And Paul says, nope, nope, not those people. Be unified with the jacked up, messed up, broken up people of the church that are exactly opposite of you socially, exactly opposite of you politically, exactly opposite of you culturally, and exactly opposite of you financially. And we go, hmm, how in the world are we going to do that? And Paul says, well, I'm glad you asked. Because how you get there is humility. And then we would say, well, what does that look like, Paul? And Paul would say again, well, I'm glad you asked. Let me make it super clear for you. And he talks about the effort of humility, the effort towards humility, the pursuit of humility that we as those who follow Jesus should be giving ourselves to. And he gets incredibly practical. He offers two don'ts and two do's. Two don'ts and two do's. So in verse 3, he says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit. If you grew up studying the NIV version of scripture, the language there is do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit to help us here. I, the two that I'll draw out for us is he's saying do nothing from selfish ambition and do nothing for selfish behavior. No selfish ambition, no selfish behavior. So what is selfish ambition? Selfish ambition involves prioritizing my interests, my desires, my success over and above everyone else. This often leads to our competition mindset. It leads to conflict. It leads to division. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, he wrote this. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. Hear that one more time. Pride gets no pleasure out of just having something. No, no. Only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking there would be nothing to be proud of that. And Paul is saying, if you look in a way of comparison at all to feel somehow important and valuable, stop. Because the path towards Experiencing the wonder of the gospel and the unity that Christ has called us to is to live lives of humility. And in that life, there can be no selfish ambition. The second thing that he says is there can be no conceit or vain conceit, the NIV says. Literally, it just means no selfish behavior. It means, I mean, we know what selfish behavior is. We like to point to toddlers as being selfish, right? But how many of us continue that toddler behavior up and through our entire lives? This idea of, of selfishness, it's this sense of self-importance that it's not really based on anything and there's not really true merit for that importance. It's just I'm important and I'm more important than you and I deserve what I deserve to have. So maybe it's me because I was just traveling but you know the best place to observe that, observe that type of behavior? The airport. <laughs> I don't know what it is about our culture and lines, but when you put people in a line, and really this goes to any line, traffic lines, grocery lines, bank lines, even Chick-fil-A lines for heaven's sakes, what comes out of us? 
this like selfish desire, this like I deserve to be valued and shown that I'm important. I should be able to cut right to the front of that line because of who I am. If you knew that I was the pastor of the Summit Church, you would say, well, Brian, you deserve, you go ahead and cut right through TSA. You go ahead and sit in the front of the plane. You go ahead and cut right through traffic. You guys aren't laughing because you know exactly what goes on in your minds just like me. Oh, we are so quick to be selfish. We are so quick to think that we deserve to go right to the front of anything. And the longer you're at the airport, the longer that plane gets delayed, oh, the more the heat gets turned up and oh, you think humility starts oozing out of people? Do you know what all the numbers say about culture? It says people are serving less, they're giving less, they're less interested in the needs of others and helping others. Generosity of people is decreasing. Selfish behavior is drastically increasing. Now, when I said the word culture, what did your mind go to? Because I don't like to do this often, but I will tell you that I just Jesus juked you. Because those are all the realities of what's happening in the church. The reality is that our church culture in some ways is no different than what's happening in the outside culture. Serving in the church is down. Giving in the church is down. People caring for the needs of others in church is down. Why? Well, Paul says, if you want to pursue the life Jesus has for you, there is no place for selfish ambition. So stop. Then Paul turns and he says, but let me encourage you. He says there's two things you can do. In humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So basically, the two things Paul says here is he says, count others and look to others. And if I could just summarize these two things put together, I think what Paul is calling us to here, he's saying the evidence of being someone who's pursuing humility in their lives is that we will become people who are deeply interested and deeply considerate of the flourishing of anybody and everybody we are around. Paul is saying humility is respectful. It's modest. It's gentle. Humility gives people the benefit of the doubt. It asks questions like, in the midst of whatever's going on in that person's life, what might they need and how might I help them? It's serving, not being served. It's giving rather than taking. It's responding rather than commanding. It's fitting into others' needs rather than wanting others to fit into ours. We know humility when we see it. It's powerful. It's powerful. I remember being in Slovakia. I talked about a little bit about this trip last week. I remember being in Slovakia when I was 19, and we had this mission team, this sing team, that was traveling through Eastern Europe to go serve churches and share the gospel in schools and different things. And this one came to this one town, this tiny little town that had had a secret church for many years. And the on our team, there were three guys, and at this one house, me and this other guy, Jesse, were going to stay at their house. 
and it was a two-bedroom house. They had the master bedroom, and then they had a bedroom where four kids slept in. And you, you know what I'm about to say. So we come, and we're about to stay in this house, and this pastor says, hey, Brian and Desi, you sleep in our room. And we're like, no, 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 we, we, can't, we're, we can't do that. Are you, we're not going to stay in your room. And he's like, no, you guys are here to bring the message of the gospel, and I, I want you to get a good night's sleep, and I want you to be cared for. I was a 19-year-old, sweaty, pimply, long-haired, selfish teenager. And this pastor had the desire in his heart to say, no, no, I want to look to your interests, Brian, above my own. I want to consider you, Brian, above myself. Listen, in some ways, this sermon is pretty easy. There are two paths before us. There is a path of pride or the path of humility. And we have the choice to follow one of two representatives. We can be like Adam or we can be like Jesus. We can be more like Adam or we can be more like Jesus. We can pursue pride and what's best for us. We can pursue pride and what I want. We can pursue pride and what selfish ambition, what selfish desires call us to pursue. Or we can pursue Jesus. We can pursue humility. We can pursue the flourishing of others. There really is just one law to live by when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, and that is this. Jesus is Lord. He is the king. He is the one that we follow. He is the one that we submit to. He is the one who we humbly come under. Friends, to be blunt, the only thing that can destroy us eternally is the lack of of humility. You can lack so many other things when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, but you cannot lack humility. It is the essence of the first step that happens when we start to follow Jesus, is we say, I have no merit of myself. I have no worth in and of myself. I need someone besides me. That's where Christianity begins. And that's why God lifts up the humble. Which leads us to the effect of humility. Here's what happens when we're humble. The effect of humility is God's grace. Listen to James 4, verse 6. It says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I would love to spend some time here talking about what it means to be opposed. Like, if you opposed me, what that might feel like and what that might look like. But imagine the creator and the king and the one being that there is no one like in the world that says, Brian, if you're not humble, I'm going to oppose you. Which means whatever you put your hand to, no matter what you try, I'm just going to press against you. I mean, if that's Steve Martin opposing me, I mean, I might be able to handle that. I'm a little younger than he is, maybe a little bit better looking. I mean, I've got some things going against Steve here. That could happen for me, right? But if God says, look, I need you to know something. You have one of two paths that you can choose. If you chose the path of Adam, then I'm, I'm going to oppose you. Or you can choose the path of Jesus. And if you choose that path, I will shower you with grace. I will shower you with the most wonderful and beautiful gift that you could ever imagine. Grace must be our greatest and most valued currency in order to power humility. 
There has to be something in our hearts that said, I need your grace, God, so desperately that your grace to me is so much more beautiful and so much more wonderful than any gift or any monetary thing or any promotion or any blessing or any approval, that your grace to me is so much beyond anything that I would receive in this world. If that really truly becomes our desire, humility becomes a natural outpouring of our lives. Can we want God's grace so badly that we would give people the benefit of the doubt? Can we want the grace of God more than we want to win? Can we want the grace of God more than we want to be right? Can we want the grace of God more than we want to be successful? That more than anything I want, it's God's grace. And if humility is the path to grace, then the call, the simple call is to pursue humility. I will humble myself even right now. My friends, humility, it isn't natural to us. We must pursue it. We must think about others. We must consider others. We must look to others that this natural pattern of putting others first in our lives is the call here that Paul is desperately asking us to consider. You know, it's interesting if you think about it. Even though humility is not natural to us, it was natural to Jesus. He was born in humility, he lived in humility, he died in humility. Even in his resurrection, It was in humility. He didn't come out of that grave and go, Here I am! I made it! I'm alive! (laughs) Woohoo! Who did he speak to first? A woman, marginalized, despised in culture. And in humility, he said, Mary, here I am. Paul says, have that mind. Can we ponder just for a moment that the God of the universe put this into practice for us? That he looked to you. That he considered you. Do you know what happens in my class when my professor looks at me and considers me? (laughs) I think, I did it. (laughs) But I had to be the best I could be for him to look at me and consider me. Here's when Jesus considers you and me. Here's when Jesus looks at you and looks at me. When we're prideful when we're spitting on him, when we're rejecting him. Have you ever experienced someone showing you grace when you're at your worst? It's transforming. And that's what Jesus did for you and me. He humbled himself to the point of death on the cross because he counted us And he looked at us, and in humility, he gave up everything he had so that we might experience and be given his grace. And in that display of his humility, he brought for those of us who would humble ourselves before him, life, love, purpose, hope, joy, forgiveness, mercy, justice, freedom, and so much more. And he says... In the same way that my humility brought you life, if you've tasted that at all, then be humble.
pursue humility. And as you do that, this is the beauty of the wonder of what it means to step into the humility. It's so countercultural, so counter what we want, so opposite of what we think is going to do anything for us. What Jesus is promising here through the words of James is as you press into humility, as you pursue humility, as you look to others, as you consider others, what will happen to you? Well, what he's saying is that grace will explode in our lives. The taste of grace, the robustness of his grace will become even more and more a reality of, life, of our lives. And so, church, can we become pursuers of humility today instead of procrastinators? I heard a story about a man who went into a little British town to climb a mountain right behind the town. And the townspeople were saying to him, look, it's higher than you think. The, the weather is worse than you think. You need to prepare more than you think. And he had this sort of overconfidence and, and didn't go up with the appropriate gear. He thought he knew what he was doing. And he walked out of the village one morning with all kinds of confidence and swagger. And he started walking up the mountain with his head held high. Only several hours later to come back crestfallen. Didn't even make it halfway up. And there was an old lady who saw him coming back, and she said this, Son, if you'd gone up the way you came down, you would have come down the way you went up. If you'd gone up the way you came down, if you'd gone up with humility and listening and learning and trusting, then you would have come down celebrating, rejoicing. Which is another way of saying, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will give you grace. Pursue humility, church, and God will provide you the great currency of his grace, the grace that says you are valued, the grace that says you are looked at, the grace that says you are considered, and the grace that says you are counted. I'm going to pray this morning right now that God would release us of our pride so we can enjoy God's grace and be sent to display his grace through humility. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you struggling with the reality that the way up is down, <laughs> that everything about your kingdom is backwards to the way we think. The way to experience love is to love. The way to experience grace is to be gracious. So, Father, this morning we acknowledge that the step that we ta took to start following Jesus eventually had to be a step of humility. And so we ask for your forgiveness that somehow we got off course, that somehow we allowed selfish ambitions and selfish pursuits and vain conceit to, to blind us from what it means to be the humans that you called us and brought us in to be. Lord, forgive us for looking to other currencies as more valuable than your grace. And so in this moment, we humble ourselves and we give thanks that you look to us, that you considered us even when we were at our worst that we might have hope, that we might have freedom, that we might have joy. So even right now, God, in this second, we humble ourselves before you and we declare you are king. And if what you ask of us is to be humble people, then through the comfort we have in Christ, through the love that we have through you, through the power of your spirit, and through the beauty of your family, 
lead us into humility. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.